my worst enemy The flesh that's covering me Brings me down to my knees Welcome to Sermons in the Park a ministry exploring biblical truth from the Word of God, focusing on the truths that help us in our daily walk with Christ in every aspect of our lives. Now, here is your Reverend, Jamie McCaskill. Hello, brothers and sisters, and welcome back to an all-new Sermons in the Park. As always, I am your Reverend Jamie McCaskill, and this is the second sermon I promised, and looking at the way things are going, I should be able to have this up for Sunday evening, so... If you listen to this Sunday morning sermon, you know, we touched just a little bit on, on the experience that these Emmaus, and, and was it not a powerful story? You know, as we said, this was not only one of the many, many, you know, appearances of Jesus after his resurrection, but it also shows us how, how we can look throughout all of Scripture— and see and just kind of watch the Lord's plan unfold. This story that was, you know, the final chapter uh, of Luke, it's it's very very beautiful and very like I said very powerful story. You know, it's like this is one of my favorites. So here we have these two men who who are tore, you know, they're just tore up over the death of Jesus. And they're they're in this very deep and powerful conversation with him, only, of course, they do not realize that this is Jesus. Think about it. Here they are on the road to Emmaus. They're leaving Jerusalem. They're, they're leaving the other disciples behind in Jerusalem. And they, they find themselves learning about the Christ from the very source. And then when, when they realize that, hey, Hey, we we've been talking to Jesus the whole time. They turn around and they head back to Jerusalem to tell the other 11 apostles the great news that Jesus has indeed risen. If that's not powerful, then I do not know what is. <laughs> Amen. This is a story full of full of lessons, lessons about things like discernment and hope and the truth. The truth that the Old Testament prophesizes the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look just a little bit closer to this than, than we did this morning. And we're going to figure out, you know, how a deeper understanding of the road to Emmaus can help us in our own personal journey of faith today. So the story of Emmaus takes place in the Gospel of Luke, like I said, the last chapter, chapter 24, and it takes place between verses 13 and 35. It occurs just days after the crucifixion of Jesus, the same day that we find those women who, who go and find the stone rolled away from the tomb and the body of Jesus is missing. What most people do not think about, you know, some preachers will avoid it altogether, is the fact that in those days, women were seen as not as reliable witnesses. So when they told these 11 apostles what they had found, and how these two angels had spoken with them, they didn't believe them, right? And then later on that day, these two men, they're walking to Emmaus. They're discussing what had happened in these last few days. And we read that they're troubled. In fact, the, the Gospel of Luke tells us that their faces were downcast. Read with me Luke chapter 24, verse 17. Let me flip over there myself. It says, And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk, 
and are sad. So they're walking, and Jesus comes up, and he listens to them, right, as they're speaking. But they don't recognize him. They don't know that this is Jesus. Now, I did not talk about this earlier, but them not recognizing them, recognizing Jesus has nothing to do with them, okay? It's not their fault. It's not that they're, they're stubborn or anything, because the Bible tells us that this was kept from them. They were not, they, they were not able to recognize him, because that's the way that, it, you know, they, that Jesus wanted it. Read with me uh, one verse before that, Luke chapter 24, verse 16. It says, but their eyes were holden that they should not know him. So we see that Jesus asked them, he asked them, what are you talking about? And we read that they, they give him their version of what has happened, as well as, you know, their disappointment over their hopes that they, they believe are not, are not fulfilled. And of course, you know, hey, their confusion over what these women had seen at the tomb, right? And, and we see Jesus rebuke them. Gently, of course, but he rebukes them. Read what he tells them in chapter in verses twenty five and twenty six. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? As we said in, in, in the you know, last time, Jesus told them how the, Old Te- how the Old Testament stories, all of them from Moses to the prophets, how all of it points to him. Remember, at this point, they don't know that this is Jesus. Okay, keep that in mind. But they're welcoming the conversation. They enjoy it so much Then when they get to Emmaus, they welcome him to stay with them. And and of course, Jesus agrees. We read how he sits at the table with them and how Jesus takes the bread. He breaks it. He blesses the meal. And it was at that moment that these two disciples recognize him. The Bible says that that immediately, right, after they recognize him, Jesus disappears. The two men, they rush back to Jerusalem that evening. They find the 11 11 disciples who are still in hiding, and they tell them what what had happened. So what was Jesus' main message here? You know, when we look at the story, it seems that these men had been debating, debating, you know, what's true, why this has all happened. Because as we see the first reaction of Jesus, what does he do? He tells them they're foolish. They're slow in their belief. And that when that, then we see, we see Jesus teach them. He teaches them the truth that's revealed in Scripture. He attempts to help them in their disbelief by pointing out that the truth had already been revealed to them. The main point that's made is that everything that has happened you know, with Jesus, all of it, it all was you know, written down by, it was already predicted and written down by Moses and all of the prophets. And now it had been fulfilled. He, he, he went, he wants them to know that even though things look hopeless and yes, you had, they had their doubts. The only thing they have to look for that is the scriptures. If they do that, they understand what happened and what's going to happen. Firstly, Christ must suffer. Then he's glorified. All of it is part of God's plan. But why doesn't Jesus reveal who he is to them until dinner? You know, he doesn't do it on the road to Emmaus, does he? He waits. He waits until they arrive at Emmaus. They're relaxing. They're just about to eat, and then he opens their eyes. This has a lot to do with our discernment process. Sometimes we find ourselves unable to understand, don't we? We start to gather information. It settles in our hearts, and only when we have fully digested everything, we allow it to sink in, and then the truth comes out. Notice how these two men, they're not surprised. They're not surprised when they realize that this is Jesus. 
Look what they said in verse 32. Look right there at verse 32. They say, And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? It just took them a little time for their hearts and their heads to catch up. And when they finally did, oh, they knew the truth. And then, of course, they're fired up and they rush. They go tell the the disciples the good news. But why at the table, though? I think that it says a lot about, you know, relaxing and having fellowship at the table. When we're there, we're calm, we're not hurried, and we're filling our bellies, right? We're relaxing after a hard day of work or whatever. At the dinner table, relationships are strengthened. It's a place of intimacy and friendship. We talked about this when we, uh, when we were doing Genesis, right? About how they'll always have a meal at, after a treaty or whatever. I think it speaks of the church as well. The sort of evangelism that Jesus knew would spread the best way. It's, ro- it's rooted in relationships. But also, you could look at it this way as well. The table is a place. It's just part of everyday life. You could say that it represents the way Jesus wants us to know him on a basic everyday level. It's practical. It's authentic. It's not fancy or anything like that. It's not about class or rank. Now, one thing that I pointed out before was how we only see one of these men's names. And, and, it may, and I even asked then why. But did you even notice that it wasn't until halfway through the story that we even see his name mentioned? And I think that's because they were not important men, right? They're not part of those 11 or the special ones, you know, and, and I mean that in a significant way. Because at this point, the only people besides these two men who have encountered Jesus were those women, the ones that found the tomb empty. And one thing we need to remember, I mentioned this earlier, was that women were considered a lower status in, at that time in history. And why do I say that? Because you see, it's the women and these two men who seem to be insignificant. And they're the ones who receive these special visits. You could look at this as a way of showing the universal message of the resurrection of Christ. And by that, I mean the message that Jesus is for everyone, not just the rich, not the Jew, not the special people. Think about it. Jesus was born to a simple and humble woman, a woman who was living in a simple, humble circumstance. He spent his life suffering and wandering, being hated as he traveled from one place to the next, to the next, to the next, until finally he was arrested, he was beaten, he was tortured, and then he was nailed to the cross, where he was left there to die a terrible and gruesome death. And it's through Jesus that we all receive salvation, no matter who you are, beggar or king, homeless or billionaire. All of us have to humble ourselves to Christ to be saved. This story here, the experience of these two men on the road to Emmaus, is powerful. Not only does it serve as one of the many appearances of Jesus after he was crucified, but it also shows us that we can look at the scriptures, specifically the Old Testament prophecies, and we can watch the plan of God unfold. It also shows us a model of our own discipleship. As I said last time, Jesus opened the eyes of these two men. He showed them the truth that's in God's holy word. He revealed himself to be the resurrected Savior. And that, 
That is what we should do in our own journey of faith, on our own road to Emmaus. Thank you all for joining me here. I hope this added a little bit more to this morning's sermon. Again, I know this one's short, (laughs) but I wanted to just kind of get a little bit more out on that one uh, because I kept mentioning it during there that I, I wanted to do some more on that one. So thank you for all joining me here. I pray the Lord continues to bless and keep you. I love you all. God bless you, and I love you. You have been listening to Sermons in the Park with Rev. Jamie McCaskill. Be sure to follow us on YouTube, BitChute, and Rumble. And as always, thank you for listening. There's joy for the morning, sinner be still. Earth has no sorrow, heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow, heaven can't heal. So lay down your bed.